My name is Tony Roberts and I'm a former soldier of the British Army's 21st Special Air Service Regiment, the SAS. I also spent four years of my life working as a private security contractor in Iraq for the United States Department of Defense. When I was a child, I was captivated by military-themed action figures and toys. And these figures are directly responsible for inspiring me to pursue a career in the military. And now at the age of 45, I'm being brought into the Valiverse Action Force toy line. And I'm wondering how I came full circle, having been inspired by these toys as a child, to serving in the British Special Forces, and now becoming one of those toys that I coveted so much. How did I get from there to here? Well, here is the real story, the real truth, the real Desert Rat. This documentary film is proudly brought to you by the brand new Desert Rat Action Force figure from Valiverse. Pick up your own highly detailed Desert Rat action figure by visiting the Valiverse.com website, where you'll also find scores of other elite Action Force figures, accessories, and comics. All the links are in the description below. Shop Valiverse, because it's time for action. I grew up on the south coast of England, not far from Brighton. Childhood was, was good. Like, I've got great memories of childhood. I, we didn't have a lot, but we never went without. And that was my world. And I really thought that, you know, most people in England lived the way we did. You know, I, I would say we were working class, but um, it was a good childhood. And I've got lots of, lots of fond memories of growing up on the south coast of England. The first toys that ever really made a big impact on me was when I was given an action man figure. Not too dissimilar to the one that's on the table here. And I can remember being in the back garden of, of my house with my dad and being presented with this Action Man figure. And I remember seeing this, this uniformed figure, you know, this toy version of a human in a uniform with a rifle. And I think he had a British beret. And I was captivated. And I'm like holding this thing in my hands like this. And I look up at my dad and I look, at this toy and I look at him and I'm like, what, what's this? And he begins to explain, you know, what the army is and what soldiers are and what they're all about. And holding this thing in my hands, I looked at my dad and I went, I'm going to be a soldier one day. And for a lot of four or five year old kids, that could have been a very, you know, a passing comment where next week you want to be Thomas the Tank Engine or... Spider-Man or Hulk Hogan or whatever it is. But my dad will tell you that he remembers that day very clearly that I said that to him because it never went away. Much like a firefighter or a policeman, a soldier is a real world hero and something that I could aspire to in, in later life. And it stuck with me and I pursued that. At the age of 11, my family emigrated from the United Kingdom to Australia. And initially that, that was great. Like, so my sister thought she was going to live in Ramsey Street with Kylie Minogue and I thought I was going to go hunt crocodiles with Mick Dundee and the reality was quite different. But the first couple of years in Australia were, were quite good. But then I got to a point where I was left to my own devices quite often because my mum and dad were out working all the time and all of a sudden I, I learned that I could, you know, not turn up to school. I could you know, play hooky from school. Through that idle time, um, I started to, I suppose, hang with the wrong crowd. I think I started drinking alcohol at 14, tried smoking weed around the same age. At school, there were, there were a few subjects I really enjoyed, one of which was orienteering and cross-country running because it had that... I could see the benefit in that when it would later come to me wanting to get into the army. You know, orienteering taught me how to read maps and use a compass. Science and calculus, I couldn't give a crap about, you know. <laughs> you know, as, as I got a little bit older, I started to learn about army cadets. And it was like, you know, this thing you could do part time during high school. And I joined the army cadets and I'd never really been one for team sports or anything like that. That became my, you know, I, I was very, very passionate about 
the army cadets and they go those guys became my friends and I, I think I really drifted through most of my high school not really having any close friends at school all my mates were army cadets during the week I'd be playing hooky from school I might be stealing a few coins here and there to buy cigarettes smoke cigarettes or drink a bit of alcohol and I was, you know Monday to Friday there's kind of no direction I remember the night before, I would always be like, like, snap out of it now. You need to iron your uniform. You need to polish your boots. Getting there 45 minutes early, making sure everything was ready to go. Well, they called it a drill night. It would start with a parade. As my high school years progressed, I ended up becoming one of the sergeants of, um, of the company there. So I would be standing out the front and I would make them, you know, a company on parade and everyone would, would march out to my orders. And there was just, Something about that kind of discipline that just appealed to me. So then, you know, my high school years came to an end and as soon as I was old enough, I'm joining the army. I did all the aptitude tests. They said that I had the aptitude to go and become an officer or something like that. I wasn't interested. I wanted to go general enlistment. I wanted to be in the infantry. Um, there was, I think, a platoon of around 40 guys I went through recruit training with and we were told you could go to artillery or engineers. So I went to the engineers and spent the next three years of my life pushing wheelbarrows around, building an air force base in far north Queensland. And it wasn't the army kind of thing that I had dreamed about my whole life. And you need to understand that <clears throat> I was someone who, since the age of four, who was now 21, so for 18 years, 17, 18 years, all I'd ever wanted to be was a career soldier. And I ended up leaving the army after four years of literally pushing. I didn't even wear a, a real uniform in the army. The, the job that I did with the engineers, I used to wear khaki shorts and a short sleeve shirt and work boots. Like I, I didn't even wear a camouflage uniform the last two years I was in. So I'd become very disheartened and I'm not blaming the army for that. It's just, you know, that's just how, how the chips fell for me. But I returned to civilian life in my early 20s with really no direction and it became very easy for me to descend into more and more uh, drug use and I started taking a lot of ecstasy on weekends which progressed into methamphetamine and the next few years were, 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 were a dark time in my life. Having aspirations of things like joining the special forces within a family that was very much like, oh, you'll, you'll never achieve that. And I think that is part of what spurred on this dark side in me that I wanted to, to, to challenge the, the status quo within my current existence and, you know, the family that I, I had grew, grown up around and do well in school, get a half decent job, enough money to provide for your family and you're a success. I didn't see it that way. And, and, and I really resented those kind of comments in the family. So, um, but at the time, I didn't see an alternative. I, stri I, I, I spiralled into you know, drug abuse some petty criminality and um, got into some debt to some, some of the wrong people. And I had some fucked up experiences for a few years there in my early 20s. I'd been threatened physically a, a few times and I was like... What am I going to do? And I'd already, I'd started, I had already started to think about leaving the country to get out of the cycle that I was in. I decided to, I suppose, flip the script and um, I ripped off some, some pretty serious people for about $20,000, shared it with a friend of mine and, and left the country for, for a new life. I didn't really know what that life was going to be. It was, you know, a backpack and a plane ticket to Barcelona at the time. But um, again, I think I, it's me challenging that status quo. I'd seen other people get into debt to nasty people like these and then end up, you know, in hospital with broken legs. I'm like, fuck, they're, they ain't, they're not going to get me. I'm going to turn my life around, get away from these horrible people, and, you know, have them help fund the transformation at the same time.
Yeah, so I travelled around Spain with a with a good friend of mine, um, and initially it was it was awesome. Didn't have a lot of money, but backpacking, I, I was really enjoying that whole kind of lifestyle and trying to find work along the way and really struggling because I didn't speak Spanish. So of course, if you if you're a backpacker who wants to work in Spain, you need to go to a place where people don't speak Spanish. So I went to the Costa del Sol, <laughs> um, and it was the Costa del Crime as they call it, and um, uh, got some bar work there. Enjoyed working in a bar. I worked for a Danish guy for a while, and things were great for I, I want to say a few months. I mean, my friend was staying in a backpackers hostel over the months that we had worked in this town and stayed in this backpackers hostel. We'd seen a lot of other backpackers come and go. Go. There were, you know, there'd been some nice groups of young women come through from different parts of the world and other young backpackers. And then one day this guy from London arrives and my... L later on in my military career, I would learn about situational awareness and I feel like I have a very good sense of street smarts. And I met this guy who arrived at this backpackers hostel and I instantly took, I wouldn't say a disliking to him. I knew this guy was trouble. Maybe the bad in me could see that there was more bad in this guy. And I, and I knew this guy needs to be kept at arm's length. Unfortunately, my friend didn't realise the same thing. And um, my friend, you know, he enjoyed a drink like I did, but... These two, over the first few days the guy was staying there, we would get home from the, from the bar quite late at night after our shift and this hostel had a shared balcony where you kind of walked up the stairs and the balcony went all the way around the front of the building uh, and all the doors into the rooms were there. So if you came out on the balcony, it wasn't your private balcony, it was shared. It was almost like the, the upstairs outdoor corridor kind of thing. So if you were smoking and drinking outside, you could see anyone else from the hostel who was outside. And my friend started to drink with this guy a fair bit. And I remember going into work one night, saying to him, I was like, that, 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 that guy's bad news. You really, you want to stay away from him. I can tell that he's bad news. My mates, as he, as he always was, he was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm all good. I can handle it. I'm all good. And, and then that night we got home there was like a sun lounger outside my room and I sat on that sun lounger and smoked a spliff of hashish. My friend started drinking vodka with this guy and they wanted, to, they wanted to go out drinking. And I was kind of trying to hint to my friend as best I could that he shouldn't go, but there was no kind of telling him. And yeah, yeah, we're, they're going to go to the bar together. And I didn't want to go simply because of this guy that I didn't trust. So they get changed and they leave the backpackers hostel. And I want to say 10 or 15 minutes later, I'm still sitting on this sun lounger, you know, probably finishing this spliff or whatever. And my friend comes walking up the stairs and I see him stagger around the corner and he's staggering and he's clutching his chest and blood is dripping from between his fingers. And instantly I'm like, what, what the fuck? And he's like, Dave stabbed me. He just fucking stabbed me. Like, what? What's going on here? So I quit, I run over to my friend. I think I think I sat him down, and I was like, I'm gonna get some towels or whatever I can to to cover the wound. And as I sort of say this, the guy who stabbed my friend, he comes walking up the stairs, and he's didn't mean to do it. Didn't mean to do it. Don't call the cops. Don't call the cops. All this stuff. I'm just gonna call him the assailant because I don't want to use his real name. The assailant who'd stabbed my friend was from, um, I believe, North London. He was definitely a Londoner. And he kept using the word pucker. And as they were walking down the street, my friend was not really familiar with that slang term. And, and he's kind of turned and laughed. And he's like, what's this fucking pucker word you keep saying? And that was enough for this guy to snap, turn around and stab him straight in the chest with a knife that we didn't even know he was carrying. My friend's in trouble Tell him, I'm not going to call the cops. Just leave us alone. I went into my room and I, I can remember being sat on the end of the bed and I'm just in a pair of shorts and nothing else. I had no shoes on, no T-shirt. And I was pulling like linen and, and towels or whatever it was out of the drawers. And the assailant is standing in the doorway. He's not posing any threat to me, 
but he seemed to be petrified of the police being called and he's I didn't mean to do it I didn't mean to do it I'm sorry all kinds of stuff don't call the cops but I'm like mate just leave me alone all I want to do is help my friend and as this happens my friend came walking up behind him with the empty vodka bottle that they drank just half an hour before and smashed it over the back of his head as he smashed the vodka bottle over his head, all the glass came towards me. As I said, I was, not, I was only in a pair of shorts, so I shielded my face from the, from the broken glass, and by the time I looked back up, the assailant had turned around, pinned my friend against the wall, and started violently stabbing him all the way up the side. He stabbed him twice in the neck. I charged at him like three metres, and by the time I grabbed him by the wrist, controlled the knife, and I think I literally, I, I think I just fell to the ground and pulled, used my body weight to pull him down with me. I have a moment of, I have a moment of blackness then that I just don't remember. I don't think I was knocked unconscious. I know I was wrestling with a guy on the ground and he was banging, he started banging my head against the tiled floor. But there is a moment there where I lost time because I can't imagine. My whole mind was focused on controlling this knife. I had two hands controlling the knife in his one hand. And the next moment that I come to, my friend is squat down. This guy's in his room, packing a bag, grabbing his passport and stuff. And I'm tending to my friend and... I don't know how I ever let go of him or, or how I didn't get stabbed. It's very confusing. But in that moment between my friend smashing the bottle on his head, me shielding myself from the glass, turning around and running three metres, he'd stabbed him 17 times, all up the left-hand side of his body. I remember I started begging him he had a mobile phone. Not many people in the early 2000s when you're backpacking have mobile phones. I was asking him for his mobile phone. He was like, nah. He took his phone, his passport. He had a, a small like day sack of stuff. And he locked his door and he took off. I'm then stuck on this balcony. There were some other girls around who had freaked out and gone into their rooms. And I'm now starting to do my best to try and stem the bleeding and in Spain, you know, you have those, those whitewashed walls and there's just spurts of bright red arterial blood up these walls. A vision that, you know, I wake up to in the middle of the night sometimes today and it's more than 20 years ago that this happened. So I did my best to stem the bleeding. Um, I had blood starting to fill up in, in one lung. So I'm trying to remember first aid training from the military and have that lung down to try and drain it and then I'm and you get all confused in these kind of situations and then all of a sudden I heard a car coming down the street and I knew that I if I ran all the way along the balcony down two flights of stairs I would miss the car so I just turned and jumped off the balcony barefoot an innocent young Spanish local girl driving some little buzz box of a car and all of a sudden a guy jumps off the balcony almost, you know, wearing nothing but a pair of shorts and covered in blood. I would have freaked her the hell out, but thank God I freaked her out enough that she called the police. Um, the police arrived first. I, I don't know how long it took. I want to say it was more than 30 minutes from the incident to when the police arrived. I'd kept him alive all that time. But I remember him telling me, his last words to me, he looked up to me and he said he didn't want to die there on that balcony in Spain. And as I let go of his hand to let the paramedics take over, I saw... If you've ever seen the life just evaporate from a human being, there are physical signs. You see the pupils dilate. I felt my friend's life be extinguished that day and it's changed the rest of my life forever.
So after my friend's murder in Spain, like I, I was so incredibly traumatised and I returned to my hometown on the south coast of England and I tried to find some good out of that situation and I looked back at the way I had behaved there in a sense, you know, I, I wasn't able to save my friend's life, you know, the circumstances was definitely against me, but when everybody else was freaking out to the point where they needed to be sedated by the paramedics, and I was still cognizant enough to um, draw a sketch of the knife for the police and things like that. I almost felt as though I had been tested in that way that I always wanted the military to test me. And I felt as though I had kept my call cool under pressure. So I started to consider a second career in the military, this time, you know, in the British Army, where, you know, in the country where I'd grown up. And it just so happened that very shortly after September 11, 2001, I, I was still deeply traumatised by my friend's murder. And then I saw, as most of us did, you know, on the TV, this life-changing event. And I knew then and there that the world would go to war. I, I knew this was going to need boots on the ground. And I was like, after pushing wheelbarrows around for four years in the Australian Army, I was not going to miss this second opportunity. And if I was going to do it this time, I wanted to do it with the best of the best. So I joined the British Infantry and then very quickly applied to go on Special Forces Selection. The toughest part of selection for me initially was, even though I had military experience... I was not that well prepared for the situation they put you in on special forces selection where you have to go out as an individual. You have to be confident in your own navigation. You have to be physically fit, disciplined, determined. You know, you can withdraw from the course at any moment. I think up until that point, I thought I was a person who had never really relied on others for decision making and but that course actually brought that out in me that you know, sometimes I would probably hide behind a friend or colleague who might be a bit more experienced. And um, I felt confident, but I knew I really had to boost that self-confidence. And as hard as the course is physically, it was that mental part of you're out there, you're being tested alone, you're not in a group. And any failure is solely on me. And I marched around the Brecon Beacons for a month, all through test week. And the whole time I was thinking about my friend who bled to death on that bal balcony in Spain and that I had somehow survived that incident and kept my head together. Nothing on selection no one was going to murder me on selection. I was trying to maintain that mindset that that's the worst thing you've ever been through in your life. There's nothing that's going to happen on this course that can be as bad as that. And if you got through that, you can get through this. One thing I found very different about the Special Forces compared to regular army units is that you end up with this organisation completely full of alpha males or almost you know where a lot of other military units they're not like that is there's a few alpha males there, there is still camaraderie you know i i have friends from selection and the special forces that will be dear friends of mine for the rest of my life but it's like the one or two guys that you went on selection with and then you go into a, a big squadron it's not like the 40 guys in the regular army that you all went through p company with or whatever you know the the parachute regiment course. This is very different because only a handful of you get in um, and then you, you, you go off to different squadrons. There might only be one or two of you from your squadron who get through. Soldier to soldier relationship, it's not what I was um, expecting, but there's a lot of fun to be had in the special forces as well. A lot of fun. You get all the Gucci gear, you get to play with some of the fun stuff. You go to some really interesting places around the world and... Um, Probably the best part of it is a lot of that typical military bullshit 
you know, the polished boots, the parades, the you don't do any of that stuff. No, no one's too fussed if you've had a shave or not, and if you haven't bloused your trousers, no one really gives a fuck. You're special forces, who cares? When I opted to get out of the Special Forces, it's because I had seen a lot of other friends go out to Iraq doing private security work, and I knew the money was good. At that time, there was this common phrase among military guys that the, um, you know, the road to Baghdad was paved with gold, and all you had to do was, was get out there and, and, and you were gonna earn some good money. When I first went out there, I went straight to Baghdad, and my initial assignment was to work as part of a close personal protection team for a two-star American general of all things. We were either special forces or military police who were close protection trained. This general was in charge of the civilian police assistance training team. His name was Major General Mike Jones. He was a, he was a great guy um, and I was one of his close personal protection officers for the first nine months of his 15-month tour until I moved on to another job. But as the general heading up the civilian police assistance training team, the organisation that he commanded was made up of police trainers. And these guys were law enforcement officers from all over the United States. You had NYPD, LAPD, Sheriff's County guys. There wasn't a military unit who could escort the general around to the different Iraqi training, police training facilities. Then it started to make sense to me why they needed a team of specialist, experienced guys to escort him, be it down Rude Irish to Alfor Palace or jump in a Blackhawk with him. And very, very interesting role. You know, I, I was based inside the US Embassy in Baghdad, which at the time, it's not the new embassy they have now. It was um, Saddam's former presidential palace. You know, there's, um, there's an Olympic-sized swimming pool out the back. And I remember my first night staying in like a porter cabin out the back of the embassy covered in sandbags and we walked up past the swimming pool at the back of the presidential palace and I thought I had entered the fucking twilight zone. As I'm walking in, there was women in bikinis sitting by the pool, but they're in bikinis and they've got drop leg pistol holsters. There's US Marines sitting around and I could hear country and western music. And as I came around the corner, next to this swimming pool was a whole group of Americans because it was the Thursday night line dancing competition. And it's one of those surreal moments in war where you just think, where the fuck am I? <laughs> but for me, that, that was a wonderful memory and, and, and you know, one of the better memories I like to cherish from my time in Iraq. Uh, two British contractors from my company were... Uh killed yesterday. An IED or a roadside bomb, whatever you want to call it, has um, hit the vehicle, um, hit the lead vehicle, killed two of the lads. Politicians and the people back home, you know, they, they're, they're interested when, when servicemen are killed, but ex-servicemen, you know, we're out here doing the same job, but you know, obviously because we're, we've come for the money and not for queen and country, I suppose you'd say. Um, It's not, it's not pleasant at all. I wanted, I suppose, a little bit more, I wanted a bigger challenge. And I heard that the company that I worked for had a different contract working in support of the effort to, to rebuild Iraq, uh, what they call the Iraqi reconstruction effort. And I heard that they had a number of what they called reconnaissance liaison teams that were made up of uh, three to four well-experienced, well-trained expatriates, mostly British, but a few Americans and Australians as well, who would recruit and train five to six local Iraqis, bring them into the team. And basically, we, the US State Department was spending billions of dollars trying to rebuild Iraq. And when I say rebuild Iraq, we weren't rebuilding what was damaged during the war. We were rebuilding what Sam had Saddam had neglected since the 1970s. 
roads covered in potholes that were so dangerous that people were getting killed on them every day. Saddam did not spend money rebuilding his own country. They had, you know, oil rich country. None of the oil rigs could actually get oil out of the ground. They had water treatment plants that didn't work, run down police stations, schools, broken down hospitals. So the State Department and, and this whole concept of rebuilding Iraq was not due to the damage, you know, sure there was damage caused during the initial coalition invasion of the country, but what I saw being rebuilt over the next four years in Iraq, it, it, was, it was neglect from the Saddam regime. The State Department are spending billions of dollars, for, so for example, to build an 80-bed surgical hospital in Maysan, in Alamara, Maysan province, one of the most dangerous provinces in southern Iraq. And prior to my company developing these reconnaissance liaison teams, what they would do, they would get <clears throat> various Iraqi construction companies would tender for the project. A certain company would be awarded the project. They'd get you know a down payment of however many million dollars to start construction. But because the area was too dangerous for the civil engineers to travel to, you need to understand a lot of the civil engineers were not military people. They were civil engineers, you know, working as contractors for the Department of Defense or State Department. They didn't want to travel 200 kilometers across southern Iraq and risk getting blown up by an IED. Whoa! Holy shit! So initially, the contracts were being awarded to these companies and the guys were just taking their five million or whatever they got and then disappearing to Kuwait. And the money was just evaporating. So the concept that was developed by a German special forces guy who worked for our company for these reconnaissance liaison teams, the reason they were two thirds Iraqi was that these people knew the tribal intricacies of the, the area. They had connections with local sheikhs. They could work as interpreters. And we could go into areas that even close personal protection teams wouldn't go because it was too dangerous. So I could get out to the 80-bed surgical hospital at Maysan province, take photos, interview some people, write what, I, what they called a client report for the engineer, and give regular updates to show them where their money was going. So they started to really drip feed the money to the contractors as opposed to the early days when they gave them lots of money. And through our constant visits and reports, we, we, we basically we, we helped prevent the loss of a lot of money that was intended for the rebuild of Iraq, but was actually unfortunately stolen by a lot of unscrupulous businessmen. I used to work about three months in Iraq and one month off. And, you know, when I first started working there, because I was there for over four years, I would either go back to the UK or I would travel to Australia and see my family on my time off. But then I was, I was learning that most of the guys in Iraq uh, didn't have to pay tax on the money they were earning. It just depended on where they live you know, to make that kind of legal. Coincidentally, Australia had a change of prime minister and he changed the law in Australia. All of a sudden, I was supposed to be paying the Australian government tax for this money, even though I didn't have a residential property, I didn't own a car, uh, you know, and I might only spend two to four weeks a year in this country. They wanted me to pay tax. So I followed a lot of other contractors out to Thailand, started having my money go into a, into a Thai bank account. And uh, initially that was... That was paradise because there was a huge community of us uh, contractor types, ex British military, a lot of parachute regiment guys, Royal Marines. And yet, to start off with it, it, it was great. You're in this paradise of Thailand, enjoying the nightlife, you know, oodles of disposable income. But you keep doing that, you, you keep risking your ass for three months at a time in Iraq, having one month off and spending that month barely seeing daylight and drunk the entire time, it starts to take a toll after a while. The team in Baghdad got hit the other day. Uh, one of my colleagues is a fellow team leader, um, operates out of Victory Base, Baghdad, uh, was killed. And for me personally, it's made me really search my soul. I've been in this country a long time now. I've spent several years of my life out here Am I, am I pushing my luck much further? Should I leave now? 
you know, where the, where the fuck do I go from here? What, what, what do I do? I can't go do a, a nine to five job, you know? But whether I go back to Australia or England, not. My life here in Iraq now is what's normal for me. And, you know, when I, when I go home on, on my, my leave, you know, on my breaks back to, you know, whether it's Australia or wherever, and go fucking mad, get on the piss, fucking party all the time. That's not normal life, because it's not how I'd, I would behave when I'm, when I'm there, you know, yeah, I still go out and enjoy a drink, you know, but I mean, I just go crazy for three weeks and go back to a nine to five job working alongside people who've never been to a country like this, who have never lost friends in, in the sort of traumatic circumstances that I have, you know. It changes you, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm not the same person inside as, as, as the person I was when I first came here. Um, and I, I go home, and I feel that people don't, don't understand, and find it very difficult to talk to people. But uh, I, I honestly think I, I will end up, you know, living back in Australia for a few months and more than likely will just turn around and come back out here because this is what I know, this is who I am. I just hope it doesn't get me killed in the process. I saw some of my friends descend into drug abuse. I don't know, what, you know, some of them were trying to cope with PTSD and things like that. I began to dabble in it, but I think my experience in my earlier 20s set off some alarm bells and I knew that this was not going to end well. And for some of my friends, it didn't. Um, I lost quite a lot of um, security contractor friends to suicide in Thailand, which, which I really put down to them trying to combat PTSD with substance abuse. And that is a bad, bad combination. Very sadly, far too many veterans who take their own lives due to PTSD but when you combine that with substance abuse it's just going to accelerate that 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 descent into a very hopeless situation after a few years of this routine of 3 months in Iraq a month in Thailand 3 months in Iraq a month in Thailand the only thing i was interested in when i was in Thailand was drinking to forget and sharing the fictitious love of a local Thai girl. And it got to the point where I would spend a month in Thailand, I would barely see daylight. I would get up maybe four o'clock in the afternoon. I would go to the pub for breakfast. I would eat a meal with a couple of beers. That would normally be the only meal I would eat in 24 hours. From there, I would go to a pool hall. I would start gambling um, you know, over games of pool, playing with local Thai girls. We would go to go-go bars or strip bars, whatever you want to call them. The night would progress and then I would normally find myself in a bar called JP. At around 7 o'clock in the morning, I would arrive there at about 7 in the morning. And this place was a cross between a freak show and a horror show. Everyone who's in this bar has, has been out all night and a lot of people under the influence. And when you're coming home in the morning at 8, 9 a.m. every day, I'd catch myself sometimes in this bar in the middle of the night. Way, way beyond drunk. Now, I, I, I got to the point where I could drink half a bottle of whiskey just to warm myself up and get into the evening, you know. And I'd find myself in this bar looking around thinking, fuck, is this what you want for your life, man? I think I was trying to find some answers in the bottom of a bottle, but... You can find answers in the bottom of the bottle, but they're not the ones that you're looking for. The first time I met the beautiful woman who is now my wife, she actually hated me the first time she met me because um, it was my first day back from Iraq. I'd had a friend who had committed suicide a few weeks before. He sat on a 
sat on a port loo on a rifle range in Iraq and blew his own brains out. And I, I drank a lot of tequilas that night. And having been sober for the last three months I was in Iraq, I didn't have my didn't have my beer legs on, so to speak. And I got introduced to my wife. Within a couple of hours, I'd spewed all over myself in this bar and I probably looked like the most pathetic human being going and that did not endear me to her very well. But lucky for me, we we had the same circle of friends. So we were always, you know, going at night out here, someone's birthday, a dinner there. We were always with the same crowd and she got to know me a bit more. And I suppose when things really started to, to change is... I'd been there a while and I, I took a break from working in Iraq. I took several, I took about six months off and I had started to realise in my own head that, that my life in Thailand was really not a healthy thing and I was starting to, I suppose, scale back my, my nightlife activities and, and a bunch of guys kind of flew back to work and we had a very brief period. There was, you know, I was one of the only private security guys in Thailand at, at, at the time and we started hanging out because there was, you know, no one else around. And I think she saw behind the um, the drunken escapades, there was that somewhere deep down, there was actually a half-decent guy there. It was a real, t- uh, there was a turning point in my life, and it wasn't all about me meeting Grace. I think I, I had gotten to a point where I was sick of the life in, in Iraq. Yes, the money was good, but I was sick of having to stay battle fit. I was sick of the mental pressure I was under for three months at a time, being the leader of a team, always having to choose the route and make the right decisions in in some bad situations. And I got tired of it. And I'd seen a lot of my other friends settle down with Thai women, but I'd always seen it end bad. That's not a slight against Thai women. It's that when you live a life where you're away a lot, but you're living in a party town that's surrounded by nightclubs, drugs, alcohol, and cash, and and a and a and a, and a sex industry. They're not the right elements for building a solid relationship or marriage. I remember talking to one friend in particular, saying, "You know what? I I might sack Iraq. I might sack the private security industry. I might go. I might return to Australia." try and get into like the mining industry or something and settle down and build a family. And it was the moment when he turned around and went, you, fucking no way. I thought, that's the next great challenge for me. Do this thing that no one ever thought was in me. To be a good husband, to lead a normal... The last great challenge for me in life was to lead a normal life. And... I brought Grace to Australia. We're, we're getting pretty close to our 10th wedding anniversary this year. I've been stepfather to her son for the last 11 years. He's almost 16. I'm going to be starting to teach him to drive soon. And the first few years in civilian life was very difficult for me. But my wife was a huge support. I think part of that was due to she was also close to some of my colleagues from Iraq who had taken their own lives in Thailand and she had been through a level of trauma herself. These horrible events where 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 veterans had committed suicide but we were both close friends of those veterans. So I think where a lot of people return to civilian life and my parents still don't understand what you know what I did really and what I went through and my, my friends certainly don't you know in civilian life. To a degree, my, my wife does, because she's seen it in so many other veterans, because she was surrounded by them for years. The reason she speaks English so well, so she, she was really the rock. And yeah, the first few years were tough, but um, yeah, I think I've escaped my, my demons now. Um, I did struggle the first few years after Iraq, when I say the first, probably the first four or five years after I finally left Iraq. I, I did really struggle. I, I'm not completely free of it, you know. I I, I still tend to, to drink a bit too much alcohol, but I'm I've been cl- I've been clean of the drugs for years. And one thing that really ended up helping me was starting a YouTube channel and having a create creative outlet. I've got a 
I've, I've got quite an obsessive, compulsive personality. I actually think a lot of Special Forces guys do. You need to be a little bit obsessive to be driven enough to get through that course. And I had that, but I didn't have anywhere to, to, to put that energy. And um, I, I learned that I really enjoyed videography and, um, and storytelling to, in, in a way. So I, so I started to run a, a YouTube channel and I, what better thing to run it about than the toys that I've been collecting for years, you know, because I was so taken by that action man figure my dad gave me all those years ago that I've spent most of my adult life, you know, collecting those old toys and, and, and researching them and, and studying it and learning a lot about the history of these toys and the companies that made it and the people who designed them and... So yeah, so I've been running a YouTube channel for about six years now where I, I talk about the, toys, the, the toys of our childhood. You know, from, if you're from the 70s and 80s and you were into, be it Star Wars or Evil Knievel or Star, whatever it was, you know, I, I've probably got a video on my channel about one of those, <laughs> one of those things. So Through running my YouTube channel, you know, I, I make videos about lots of different toys but the two toy lines that I am most passionate about is Action Man and Action Force. They're my two all-time favorite toy lines, and I've done a whole series of kind of mini documentaries on the history of this line. Well, little did I know, there was this, uh, this awesome guy who used to design toys at Hasbro who set up his own company and purchased the trademark to Action Force and was making military-themed action figures for the modern collector. And because he'd purchased the, trade, the, the Action Force trademark, he was actually looking around on YouTube for some videos about Action Force and discovered that my channel was kind of a treasure trove for those videos. And through that, he, he reached out to a friend of mine and we, we got put in touch. And I remember having a video chat with him about, I don't know, a year and a half ago. And we instantly got along, you know. I liked him, pretty sure he kind of he kind of liked me. And through that private chat, he started to learn a bit about, you know, that I'd been in the military and stuff like that as well. And what I had no idea at the time of that first video chat I had with him was that he told me sometime later that he got off the phone and he went into the kitchen of his house and he said to his wife, that guy I watch on YouTube, I'm going to make him an action figure in action force. Perhaps eight months later, he, um, he had taken a whole heap of photos of, of me when I served in Iraq. These photos were on my Facebook personal Facebook page. He had taken these photos and you drew inspiration from them to create this character of, of Desert Rat. Of, you know, and Desert Rat is dressed the way I used to dress in, in Iraq. It's got a heavily customized rifle, customized the, the same way I had my rifle in Iraq. And it truly is an honor to know that through a combination of special forces service and running a nerdy toy channel on the side, the combination of those two actually made me a really good fit for the toy line because I'm passionate about this particular brand and I'm so incredibly humbled and honored that Bobby brought me into the line. So while this Desert Rat action figure you know, it might look like me, but this actually represents all the servicemen and women who have sacrificed and laid their lives on the line to defend the freedoms of, of our countries. There isn't another toy line around today who is taking real life veterans and putting them in to toy lines. You've got companies taking fictional superheroes and trying to pitch that to kids. This company, Bobby Valor and Valorverse, is taking real life veterans like myself and Tim Kennedy and putting us into this toy line as a representation of all the servicemen and women who've serviced and sacrificed. And I just want to apologize to all of them for the fact that this one looks like me. It was very emotional for me to hold this figure for the first time because I was transported back to my childhood when I first held that action figure and I looked up at my dad. And I guess maybe in my life I'd gone from 
wanting to be Action Man to being Action Man, then realizing perhaps I just wanted to collect Action Man. But now I've come full circle and I am Action Man, but the one I had as a child and not the one I was in adulthood. Thank you.